You know, the last time you interviewed me, I can remember vividly. The last time you interviewed me was in 1985 after we beat Boston in, on the parquet floor. You caught me outside the locker room. You caught me outside the locker room and asked me, you know, how I felt about it. And I said, well, obviously it's a special situation when you beat the Boston Celtics on the parquet floor. Now, the, the, there's another part to this story that I recalled when you told me you wanted to do this interview. Because the next day in the LA Times, a columnist, one of your fellow writers, but Jim Hill had some boring interviews with, with uh, 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 people of little consequence after the game. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And where is he now? And where is he now? You know, he's having that whole coach. Anyway, I, that did bring back that memory. Little, little consequence. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, we all like to be of little consequence like you have and you are. I mean, what has been the secret to your amazing success? Well, I, I don't know. When you say success, I, 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 I've been fortunate to have longevity and to be with the Lakers and all the great players and people that are in the Laker organization since I since I came back in 1981. But you gotta remember, I started with the Lakers in 1968. That was when I, when I started with them as, as a scout. And then I stayed with them for a while and then I left them in 19, I forget the year. But no one has seen more Laker basketball, been involved with more Laker basketball from, a, uh, from an intimate point than you. Well, I, <clears throat> I'd be willing to match the number of games, the number of games that I've seen for the Lakers. When I when I think about it, uh, I, I, I haven't. I'm almost positive I haven't missed the Lakers games since nineteen since since 1988. When I came back to the Lakers in 1981, when I came back to the Lakers to be Pat Riley's assistant in '81. I think I've seen every game. Sure. I mean, you know, you talk about assistant. You have been there for the, some of the biggest names, some of the biggest head coaching names in basketball. I mean, you just mentioned Riley. You know, you talk about uh, Phil. You talk Magic and other people. You, you, you've, uh, you've helped to make some really great coaches even better. Well, yes, uh, a number of them. Are, are in the Hall of Fame, which I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that, that the people I've worked with have had so much success. But not only the players, but the front office, and then of course, you know, all the great players, all, all the great Laker players, are, so many of them are in the Hall of Fame, which is, you know, which is very, which is very gratifying. I've been a very lucky person to, to have these associations over the year. You know, like I say, I even know Jim Hill, who's on Hollywood Walk of Fame, uh, and, and and all the all the Hall of Fames that you're in. You know, you're you're you stand alone in your profession. Oh, I don't know about that, but you know, it, it's it's really amazing. Let, let's talk a little bit about the people, the head coaches that you work with. Who was the strangest? Say that the strangest. Yes. Well, they're all strange. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're all strange. You know, we all have strengths and weaknesses. And and of course, the first head coach that I worked worked for was Bill Sharman. You know, and Bill Sharman had, you know, Bill Sharman had his idiosyncrasies. God bless him wherever he is. But if it wasn't for Bill Sharman, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. But when Sharman joined, when Sharman joined the Lakers. And I was doing the scouting for for the Lakers. Fred Schaus hired me, hired me initially to scout. And when when Sharman took over in, in 1971, which we won the championship that very same year, uh, he he asked me to do some things because I had been a college coach prior to joining the Lakers, and I used to do a lot of film work. 
uh, and statistical work uh, on the college level. And Sharman said, we're going to start doing some of this stuff on our level. You know, so he was, Bill was very innovative. You know, Jerry West and Elgin Baylor and Will Chamberlain never stretched in their lives until Bill Sharman be, became the coach in, in, in 1971-72. And so I started working with Sharman and Sharman had his idiosyncrasies. Number one, whenever there was a practice, we practiced at Loyola University, say the practice was at 10 o'clock. Well, the guys would be out there shooting around, but there wouldn't be no Sharman. And so uh, when pra practice was supposed to start at 10 o'clock, here he comes, he slips in the side door. Just as practice started. And then when practice ended, you look around, he was gone. And I used to say to him, hey, Bill, you know, you come right before practice starts and you get out of here. Yeah. I don't have to talk to the press and I don't have to talk to players if I'm not here and I leave early. <laughs> that, that's, that, what, that's what he thought of you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I, I know how he was. But then, then you, you, can, you can just run the whole gamut. Let's talk about someone like a Pat Riley and what he was like as a head coach. Because he, we, he really believed in being a stern disciplinarian. R Riley, Riley was a perfectionist. Pat, Pat was a perfectionist, and he only wanted the best. One of his favorite, favorite sayings used to be, I only want the best. I don't, nothing, he didn't like anything second fiddle. And so that was always a measuring, measuring stick, not only for things that we did, but also for decisions that we made. If, if, if the decision involved the team, Pat would say, what's the best thing we can do for this team? And that's what we're gonna do. Uh, and that was one of his measuring sticks. And of course, being such a perfectionist uh, and idealist, he always wanted, this used to drive me a little goofy, he always wanted to change. I said, well, Pat, uh, for example, we won the World's Championship in 1982 with Magic and North Storm and Norm Nixon. Uh, it, was, it was Jamal Wilkes and Kareem. We won the World's Championship. So the next, we enjoyed the parade and so forth. And so the next fall, when we were going to start practice in Palm Springs, or it was a, maybe it was Hawaii, Pat says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm putting in some of the Kentucky offense that we used to run it down. Pat, we just won the world championship by a particular way. The guys know the system, and now you want to change the system? He says, well, we've got to add some stuff. I said, why do we have to add some stuff? But he always had this passion to make changes. And what it was never status quo. If it was good, we can make it better, which not a bad, not, not a bad trait. You know, so he was always striving to get better. He would never rest on his laurels or rest and be satisfied. We can't sit around here and get fat just because we won a world championship. We're going for another one now. And so that was that attitude. It was that attitude that, uh, that made him such an effective coach. And of course, when he took over, I always felt this way. When he took over the Lakers in 81, 82, he was more like one of the guys, one of the players. You know what I mean? He was close, close to them. And he made the statement to him. He says, look, you guys, I'm just, had, I'm just starting out in this business. I, I don't know the answers, but we're going to play and we're going to play hard and get this thing done, you know? And, and that, that attitude was reflected in the games early in his career. He was like one of the guys on the floor. He was in there sweating and, you know, and, and playing and they and they 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 responded to that. They weren't playing for him. He was part of them. And and that and, and that and that relationship brought him a lot of early success 
which later on later on in his career changed, changed. Uh, and I say that in all respect to Pat, but that close relationship with the players made us very effective, even when we, even when we made mistakes. You know, Bill, I'm not gonna ask you about all the coaches that you work with, but we gotta talk about Phil Jackson, because when he came and he started, came with a triangle offense, then he started burning incense in the locker rooms, I can imagine some of the guys saying, what in the world is going on now? What, what, Phil Jackson? Yes. Phil Jackson in the triangle offense? Yes. Phil Jackson in the triangle offense was Tex Winter. Tex Winter created, created, designed the, uh, that, that style of play, and, that, and, and he was with Phil his very first year, very first year, unfortunately, 1990. That was the year that we, Mike Dudley coached the Lakers, along with my son-in-law Jimmy Iron, and the two, <laughs> and and the, and the, and the two of them got us to the finals against Chicago Bulls, and unfortunately we got we got beat because of Michael Jordan and and, and the Bulls team, but the. Uh, when you say, how did players react? Well, Tex Winter and Phil Jackson's style of play, the players bought into it. Not that, they, not that they had to sell them, but they just showed them that this is the most effective way for us to play. Uh, play. And that was the beginning for, of course, that was when Shaq, Shaq was already established, but Kobe, Kobe was just starting to mature. You know, and, 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 uh, Kobe had four years with Del Harris, four years with Del Harris, which was his period of maturation, where he developed, you know, he developed as a player. And so when Phil started Shaq and the triangle offense, with the Lakers, we won three straight championships. Won three straight. I couldn't believe that first one. We won in 2000. Then 2001, we beat uh, was it Philadelphia, and then uh, Orlando. Yeah, those were the, the three straight. And then Phil, Phil left, and Tom Janovich came in, and then Phil came back later on. I think it was 08 or. or, or 2008, 09, won a championship in 09, won, won another one against the Celtics in 2010. Bill, what did you think of Phil burning incense in the locker room? What about the locker room? Yeah, because Phil was known for, for, for burning incense in the locker room. Oh, <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, he was he burned incense even in the front office at different times. Which <laughs> he came up, he used to come upstairs with with, with those with those leaves, and 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 uh, it didn't sit too well with some of the the staff. But but it, it, that was Phil Jackson, and that was one of his idiosyncrasies, so to speak. What did the players think of that? They bought into it. When, when, when you win, you don't have to sell. When you win, everybody wants to join in. And, and, and of course, with the success that we, that we had, that we were having at that time, it was a big selling point that this was the way to play. And- uh, Bill, can you talk a little bit about the importance of Jerry West and what he means and meant to the Lakers, not only as a player, but when he retired and became executive because he was really involved and maybe responsible for getting this dynasty on roll. Jerry West, my relationship with Jerry West goes back to when he was a player and when I was a coach. Believe it or not, I was coaching a, a junior college in Santa Maria, California, Hancock College. And at that time, Jerry West was a high, high school player in West Virginia. 
And a, a friend of mine, by the name of Sherman Nearman, used to tout different players for me that I would want on a contract. And so he sent me Jerry West's name. And I asked, I asked, I asked him, he said, how, uh, how much is a kid weigh? So oh, I think he weighs about 107 pounds. I, I I don't. It's too light for me. I, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in Jerry West. And that was my first exposure to Jerry West. <laughs> lo, lo and behold, lo and behold, Jerry West becomes a great college player at West Virginia, and then is drafted, is is, is drafted by the Lakers, and they move to California. So. Fred Schultz remembered me from my coaching days at Kent State University, and he asked me if I wanted to do some scouting. In, in, those, in, in those times, there were no scouts. The guy that did the scouting was a general manager. Fred Schultz would go on the road and, and, and scout some games, and every, every team was pretty much the same way. If, if you remember the benches in those, day, in, in those days, this is a diversion. They only had a coach, and a trainer. I don't know if you remember Frank O'Neill or not, but Frank O'Neill was a trainer and Fred Schaus was a coach. Then when Sharman came, he wanted to have an assistant. So he, he, he hired K.C. Jones as his assistant. The other teams followed suit naturally. Everybody now, was, everybody now wants to have one assistant. So the rule was you could have a head coach, a trainer, and an assistant coach on the bench. That was in the early 70s. Now, now today, you look like you have a corporate headquarters meeting behind the bench and on the floor every time there's a timeout. In those days, it was only three people, assistant coach, the head coach, and the trainer. In a lot of ways, Bill, you were like the connection between the players and the coaching staff, because I'm sure a lot of players came to you and complained sometimes saying, you know, Bill, this guy is crazy. He's running <laughs> too much. This guy's, got, this guy's out of his mind. Well, you know the system. You were a professional football player. You played, you played with all those great franchises, Green Bay and Cleveland, and I forget the first one. San Diego. Yeah. But anyway, you know how, how players are. Players want a listening ear. And, and, and naturally, players, but you've got a disgruntled player says, I think this goddamn guy's crazy. I think he's nuts. What do you think? Well, you, you've got to support the coach. You can't. You can't say, yeah, I agree with you. you know, but players always want a listening ear. But also, it's, it's therapeutic for them if they can vent their frustrations. If they can vent their frustrations, everything everything is okay. But you, but as an assistant coach, you have to be a you have to be a tactician. You have to be a philosopher. You have to be a psychologist. You know, because you, you've got to create an environment for those players where they can succeed. And they all they all have their ups and downs and strengths and weaknesses. Now, we, we're a long way from Jerry West, which was your initial question. So I'll go back to Jerry West. So when I came to the Lakers in 68, I, I, I reacquainted myself with Jerry West as a player. And, and in those days, starting about like 69 is when he started having all those groin problems and, and, uh, and, and leg problems. This was near the near the end of his career. So I knew him then as a player. And then I, I left the Lakers in 1974-75 and became uh, vice president and general manager of the New Orleans Jazz, which was a very, which was a very interesting period of my life with lots, <clears throat> lots of ups and downs. I, I, I had never been away, away, away from my family very much in my married life, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, for three or four years, I'm away from my family, and unfortunately, it was the most formative years of my two daughters, Britt and Chris. So that was a costly experience, but so be it. So I spent I spent my 
uh, that was my uh, uh, jazz, uh, New Orleans jazz experience. And, and, I, and then when Riley took over from Paul Westhead in, in 1981, he had, uh, Bill Sharman, Bill Sharman called me in his office. We were, we were playing Lakers in LA at that time. The jazz were playing the Lakers in LA. And so Sharman was there and uh, uh, naturally in his office. So he asked, he asked Frank Layton, who was our general manager at that time with the jazz, that they wanted to talk to me. And he said, I want Bill Berkey to come back and work with Pat Riley. And so that's when I, when I came back. And of course, what transpired then, you know, Bill had, Bill had the vocal, vocal problems with, and so he, he lasted a couple more years as general manager and then Jerry West took over as general manager. And so I saw Jerry West from first day as a general manager to the day that, that he left the Lakers. But the guy said, what, what's a unique quality about Jerry? Well, I said, he's a no-nonsense guy, number one. He's no-nonsense. He knows what basketball is all about. He knows a basketball, what a basketball player should look like, walk like, talk like, and behave. He knows what a basketball player should be like. It's like, I was just said, uh, I'm going to take Jerry West to, to, to the racetrack. And we're going to, in the, what do you call it area, the paddock where they have all the horses walking around. J Jerry could tell you just by the way the horse was walking around whether he, could, he, was, he was going to bet on that horse. And, and that's the way it was about players. He could tell you by the way you picked up the ball. He could tell you by the way you talked if you could play the game. Those were his instincts. He knows what a player is all about. And of course, it, obviously, Obviously, just from his career, you can see what he's been able to do. And he's the logo now. <laughs> what do you think about what you were talking about? So many things about Jerry. I'd like to get your thoughts on Jerry West now being the logo. He's on every uniform in the NBA. Well, no, somebody suggested they wanted to change the logo. I, I don't know who suggested it. They said, well, we, we should change the logo. Well, I don't, I don't know what that brought, brought about. But Jerry West and Jerry West and Elgin Baylor are, are what Los Angeles Lakers, they, are, they were the root structure of the Los Angeles Lakers in, in 1961-62 when they played at the sports arena. 6,000 people came to those games. We have more people watching pandemic games today than we had what in, in, in those days. But anyway, that, that, that's uh, he, he he stands alone as one of the great general managers of all time. Of course, he's the basketball hall of fame. What more can you ask for? You know, Bill, when, when, when we think about things, you have this gift, and this gift allows you to go through different periods of time. In, in our lives, in basketball, and, and just in general. You even today had a great deal to do with the Lakers drafting Kyle Kuzma. I'm told you kept yelling and yelling and screaming at the Lakers, get this guy until they got Kyle Kuzma. <laughs> no, no that's, that's a little exaggeration. That's a little exaggeration in the story. No, I, I, uh, I, I left coaching, active, active coaching, and 2003, when Phil Jackson was there. So I have been doing a lot of scouting, which is what I started out doing in 68. But so I'm doing scouting, okay. So I, I saw Kuzma play, I scout the Pac-12 tournament. That was one of my assignments. I scouted the Pac-12 tournament every year and still scout. I'm still doing it. I'm at my desk right now. I've been working on scouting reports on players. But I saw Kuzma in college, and he was a nice-looking, slender, athletic, 6'9", six, 6'10", six, guy that they, they, they posted up. He played in the post, played in the post. 
but he was more athletic. He was, he was very athletic. So he attracted my attention. So each year I'd I, I look forward to seeing him. Well, finally, his last season, I noticed that he was playing some on the perimeter and running and shooting some three three point shots. And then not only did he do that, when he drove, he shot a right hand hook shot and then he shot a left hand. And he was very active. So, so in, in my report, after I reported, I said, I forget the exact same year. I, I, I know I, Magic Johnson was aboard at that time and Rob Blinka. And they said, well, who's, who's the two best players who's it that you like in the Pac-12? I said, I like this kid, Kyle Kuzma. Nobody else talks about him, but I think he can play. And I also like a, a, a kid uh, from, I think it was Washington State or Colorado. He's a starting starting guard today for uh, the San Antonio Spurs. Der Derrick's, Der I can't get his last name. But those two players I recommended. So when the draft came, uh, Magic comes running out of, the, uh, out of the way. The scouts stay in one room and the, and the front office stays in the other room. And Jerry and, and, and uh, Magic comes out and says, hey, Bill, we got your guy. We drafted your guy. I said, you drafted our guy? I said, yeah, Kuzma. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been very happy. I've been very happy with the progress that Kuzma's made. He's had his ups and he's had his downs. But he's a, he's a talented player, very, very promising young player. Bill, how do you feel knowing that you've had your imprint on basketball, and in particular Laker basketball, for all of these decades, and that you are a, you are a walking piece of history? <laughs> I feel old <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> no, I, I'm not trying to be humorous, but... Uh, I, I'm, I'm proud, uh, you know, I have to say that the Lord has been kind to me with my health. Uh, I, I, I try to, uh, tr to keep my health and stay fit and so that I can stay involved with the Lakers. You know, not many, not many people keep 94-year-olds around. And uh, uh, I'm going to be 94. Uh, and so I've been fortunate. The Lakers have been kind to me uh, to provide me with the continued employment as a, as a scout and consultant. Uh, it, it, it makes me feel part. If you feel part of something, you have you, you, you have value. And I used to tell Mitch Kupchak before Mitch left. I'd say, Mitch, Mitch, if you just want me around here. To, to keep scrapbooks and, and do clippings and things like that. And I, I, I don't want to do it. I, I have to feel that I'm making some kind of a contribution. And, and so I'm proud to say it just, I'm proud to say, and, and, and this is for his, his history, and we'll go back to the early days. Number one, nobody scouted in this, nobody had a scout in professional teams in the late 60s. When the Lakers had me, then all of a sudden teams started having a scout. Nobody did film work. Sharman had me do film work because I had experience doing film work preparing my college teams. Nobody did analytics. We did what we called, well, it was like the, 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 the design of a wheel. Uh, we did what we called plus minus, which was a way that you could grade a player's performance. I used to tell Riley, when a guy comes in and, and you're, you're concerned with him about his play, and you say to him, look, you know, you are, you are not playing up to par. What's, what's the deal? Are you, are you okay? Your family okay? Is everything okay? Yeah. But, Naturally, the player's going to say, I'm fine, Cody. It's just your imagination. No, look, I'm going to show you something. And so we had this, we had this plus minus system where we graded players on, on every game. And he, Pat would say, look, you're a 400 player. 
Magic Johnson was a five, what we call a 500 player. You're a 400 player. I'm talking about James Worthy. You're a 400 player. For the past month, you've been playing at a 300 level. The past 10, the past 10 games, you've been at a 200 level. You know, so the figures don't lie. The, the, the figures don't lie. This is why I'm concerned, and that's why you're sitting in this office, and that's why I'm telling you, you got to get going. And so, the, the, so the film work and analytics in those days, and analytics today, it's incredible. Not only <laughs> incredible. You know, people thought we were a little goofy at that time in basketball with with our plus minus system, which was, you know, which was compared to what they're doing today in analytics. They can tell you anything about any combination, any defensive, anything you want to find out. It, it, it dictates. It dictates for many people what they do. Uh, to me, uh, they say, well, what do you think, man? It's what you do with it. You give me all these figures. You give me all this information. It's only as good as what I can do with it. How Can I, can I make this effective because of what you're telling me? That's what analytics is all about. Bill, how many championship rings do you have? I'm proud to say 11. <laughs> Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> you can open up your own jewelry store. You know that. <laughs> Eleven. Yeah. What's that, Jim? I said you could open up your own jewelry store with Eleven. <laughs> well, I I count them every once in a while. Yeah. Make sure my wife hasn't taken them to the pawn shop or something. <laughs> you know and realize you are a walking piece of history. Well, I, you know what? I hope you continue to see this walking piece of history walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, thank you so much for taking the time. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, you know how much you mean to me personally. You've, you've helped me in ways that I, I can't even count. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you've done for me. Not only to help me as a sportscaster, but the way you've helped me to become hopefully a giving back person that helps in the community. Thank you, buddy. Well, it's very kind of you to say that. I'm still a person of little consequence. Yeah. No, no. More than that. <laughs> <laughs>